Earlier, uh, when I was working at Puppet Labs, I sort of throw every module that I possibly had in Puppet Labs. So most of it was in Puppet Labs curation. Staging was one of those things that kind of like, eh, I'm not quite sure I should give this to Puppet Labs, and now somehow I'm associated with it. So yes, it's a zip file, tar file extractor, and uh, combination release tool. So let me get my slides back up here so that you guys can see it. And let me turn this on so it won't go off on you guys. So today, yes, the talk started off uh, being in a discussion of test-driven Puppet modules. And I found out there's like several talks here at PuppetConf. PuppetConf, once they accept the talks, there's lots of lots of different talks. There's someone who actually talked specifically about Beaker, uh, how the Beaker framework works. I think Gareth is going to talk again about more stuff about Puppet module testing. So if this is a subject you like, this conference, I think, I don't know, testing must be the hot topic this year, so a lot of people cover it. So I'm going to focus on a specific area so I avoid too much overlap with all the other talks because I think uh, uh, since Puppet Lab developed Beaker, they know it intimately very well. So I'm going to give an overview to testing Puppet modules. So um, just want to get an idea, like um, how many of you here uh, are actually running things like RSpec? Okay, so you guys are going to be familiar with the things I'm going to talk about here. Uh, this is more of an overview, and it's going to kind of give you a lay of the land, what are the things you can do, what things are interesting. Uh, and uh, I think there might be a few things that are new to you. I certainly won't be offended if you went and uh, uh, looked at the schedule and decided something else is more interesting. I will say this is more of an introductory overview, and I'll give you enough info, and I'll give you some tips and tricks, which I think is very useful for module testing, but I'm, I'm certainly not going like, to you know, crack into super level details here, because I think there's a, a lot of talks that uh, we already have here that's going to go into specific details. So um, uh, real quick, my name is Nan. I used to be a professional service engineer at Puppet Labs. Now I'm uh, um, my own little consultant. Uh, did a few work here and there. If you've seen modules and if you actually like diving into types and provider, feel free to reach out to me. I, I love to talk to people about any customization they do on Puppet. And uh, this is on the opposite spectrum. I think this is going to be an introductory to intermediate talk about how you develop and write Puppet modules and Puppet manifests. So let, let, let's take a look. And uh, I'm going to reiterate. So if this talk is not for people who write perfect code. So if you write code and it runs the first time, you don't need this talk. Uh, if you never had to upgrade Puppet, if you're like, I run a version of Puppet, it works for me, I never have to upgrade it, you don't need this talk. Uh, and if you're deploying the system that have no SLA, like who cares if I blow a few things up or there, you also don't need this talk. And also, if you've been using Puppet since 0.2, I think you're trolling me here in this room. So you also probably don't need this talk. But anyways, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's talk about testing. So testing, production in, uh, testing Puppet in production is, fill in the blank, easy, pleasant, happy. I don't think those are the words. OK, so testing production, uh, Puppet in production uh, boils down to one word, which is painful. Painful. I think that summarizes it. And uh, I'll admit, when I started using Puppet, when I started uh, uh, getting into Puppet, I was like, this is an awesome tool. And then I started rolling out production, uh, Puppet in production. Because as a beginner, and I looked at it, I was like, it does some awesome stuff. Here's a system. I need to make changes on it. I'm going to make that change on the system that is called prod. And then invariably, I found out that I am not this guy. I'm not the guy who writes perfect code. I'm not the guy who never upgrades Puppet. And I'm not running Puppet on a server that doesn't have SLA. And I've learned my lesson. So I call this the Q routine reward loop, except I don't get a reward at the end when I do something like this. At the end, I get a giant stick. And someone's going to invariably come to me and says, what did you do? So Q reward routine, and that doesn't work quite well in production. So even though people, I think Gene earlier in today's talk said, you want to deploy to production as fast as possible, but yeah, at least need to control what your, with your deployment code, that so you know your deployment code is not going to just break it out of the gate. Because this is a part that we own. Uh, the developer might own their own dev code. Their code might have bugs. But we own the part that releases the server. So we got to build a better routine. So build a positive feedback loop. So here, like even a basic mouse knows that you want the reward to be a pleasant thing at the end. So we want to build in testing. And the whole point is 
build in feedback loops for ourselves so that at the end, it's a reward for us and not a painful slap and not a zap for us. So we want to do testing cycles. And there are a lot of things that we can do towards the testing cycle to make small, tight loops, not one giant loop released to production and find out something's gone wrong. But testing purpose is to do several small loops. And each small loop, we iterate on it. And at the end of each loop, we get a feedback. And that feedback is relatively painless. And as we gradually get painless feedback and we keep improving our code, we get to a point where we can release this. And we feel confident releasing this into production system. And this is a feedback loop we want to develop. And I'm going to just borrow this thing one more time. This clearly comes from, coming from someone's book. And I'm stealing a slide here. So, if we're doing something that's painful, the solution isn't avoiding it, not doing it, but rather improving what we're doing in the routine to make this a more pleasant experience. And if you happen to have some interest seeing where those like, particular clever mouse slides come from, this is a really interesting book. It talks about the power of habit. And uh, if you happen to find something uh, you want it interesting to read, it's actually, I find it relevant uh, to the talk today. And I've been stealing a couple of slides from it. And it talks about how to build these things. And I feel like testing is very much this Q, reward, uh, routine, and reward loop, which is we're going to build in and iterate some things to give us feedback. And this feedback is going to be pleasant, because that helps us improve our stuff. And we can build several of these loops to finally get to the place we want, which is deploy to production without a big stick at the end, because we made a mistake. All right. So with that out of the way, let's get into the meat of the content and what we're going to actually talk about. So what are some of the things that we can do to give us this development-ish feedback without just rolling and rocking our puppet code in production? So the, the couple of things that we can do in terms of without doing this on any system, uh, the, the three things that we can do to give us feedback are lint, syntax, and rspec. None of these things require running Puppet anywhere actively on a system. Uh, this is stuff that you can do without access to another production system. And then when you get into testing, you need a lot more stuff to actually test this. So yeah, there's a few tools to help us out. There's Packer, Vagrant, and then finally there's a Beaker test framework. How many of you heard of Beaker? Lots of you heard of Beaker? OK, great. So that's basically uh, a simulated production environment that allows us to do testing and within it, we can run our code in a prod-like environment that allows us to validate, are the assumptions we're making, are the things we want to do inside Puppet actually happening? So that's the end result. So let's go through and see what are the development feedback we can have. And let's take a look. So the first thing we want to see is pretty straightforward, lint. Lint is something a utility that's developed. And the purpose of that is to check through your Puppet manifest and make sure it adheres to Puppet Lab's style guide. Puppet Lab's style guide is, on a lot of levels, sort of arbitrary. But if you stop people arguing about how code is formatted and everything's written similarly in the same way, it kind of gets away from focusing on the not important stuff about your code, but focus on what the code actually does. So Lint kind of just, I think, removes the discussion and the argument point of like how your code should be styled like, what it should look like. And it includes a lot of sanity checks. Like, is, is your parameters being declared? So I know there's strict mode now in Puppet, but before this, uh, this is pretty useful in pre-strict mode that it gives you some warning about variables. It tells you whether you accidentally double-coded or single-coded variables, and a lot of subtle things that kind of burns you. Because if you had a variable that was not declared, and then you just expect it in a template, you deploy it, and it kind of blows up on you. Or there's a value that's kind of nil, and you don't find out about it until much later. So this, uh, if you run Puppet Lint in your manifest directory, it'll list down all the warnings, it'll give you the errors, and it'll tell you all the problems with it. And these are things that, uh, from a s consistency level, tells you how your code looks, how it compares to style guide, and whether it's acceptable or not. Uh, and in the version 1.0, I think uh, they added a new feature, which is a dash F, which allows you to fix this, your uh, public code to the extent that it can. Uh, it can't really fix all the problems, but a lot of errors that you have can be automatically fixed. You can go back, review, see if that works. And this really simplifies the task of uh, enforcing things. If it's simply strictly things like uh, aligning hash rockets or enclosing things, uh, it can do those things automatically for you. Um, in terms of Lint, not all the behavior that it has is perfect. So a lot of times, there's things that you want to tweak and adjust. So inside the Lint project, there is a uh, test directory. I think in the test directory, there's a specific set of configurations. And all of them will be listed 
regarding what kind of test it is. So if you go back to the previous warning and you get an error message that says, hey, there's more than 80 characters, you can simply go through and if, you, if it's something that you don't agree with, you're like, I have a wide terminal. I don't care about 80 characters. I don't know what decade that recommendation come from. And I don't know who, what, what terminal this guy programs on, but I don't care about that. You can just simply just check for that message and it's associated with a test. And the test that's associated with can be disabled. So the test that checks for 80 characters is uh, a test that's simply called 80 characters. And if you want to disable it, simply say, in puppet lint in the configuration, I want to disable 80 characters. And a few other one that I, I my opinion, again, opinion gets you in trouble, right? But at least on my projects that I feel comfortable turning off is like error alignment. And uh, if a lot of you use the params pattern, uh, I'm glad that this was added. I, I'm not sure when it was added, but this was added, I think, recently, where it says, if you inherit from params class, it used to give you, always give you a warning. It says, hey, you're inheriting from params class. I don't really want to, uh, I don't think this is a good idea. But params class is, inheritance is like, I think, an anti-pattern of where inheritance is actually useful. So in this case, you can shut that off. And the reason you want to kind of disable some of these warnings is I think it's a really useful thing that you finally get into is you can turn fail on warning to true. So instead of just like kind of loosely enforce things, you can select the options, select the things that you like, and select all of those things, and then finally flip it on and says, hey, even a general failure, which typically doesn't halt everything on testing, now can be a complete failure. So take a look tweak around this project and configure it. And one, the last thing I'm going to mention is you can also tell it to ignore specific paths. So if you have some tests, especially like a spec directory, or if you're uh, packaging for Forge, you can simply tell it, hey, don't ever test here. So if you actually had things in there, it simply says, these manifests, they're not really part of this module, so I can simply ignore it. So this is completely configurable. Play around with it. If you haven't run it on your project, run it once. See what warnings comes out. Start looking through it. See what, which ones make sense to you. And then selectively figure out which part of the configuration you want to turn on or disable. And run this through your code. So past lint, uh, we can also do Puppet Parser. Uh, Puppet Parser is just a syntax checker. It actually runs through the Puppet engine itself and validates whether code is good or bad. And this will catch some really dumb mistakes. Like uh, this will say, hey, you forgot a curly brace, you forgot a comma. I know for, for people who are just trying to write Puppet code, this really helps people on your team. And as another interesting question, like uh, how many people here are like the only person managing your Puppet code? So you're, if you set a standard, so there's a few people. And how many people actually have to deal with a team of people where you have to constantly, OK. So the majority of you have to deal with a team of people who are contributing code. And this is kind of a safeguard for the rest of the team. I think the people who show up here at PuppetConf, you guys are probably the experts on your team in terms of how Puppet should look, how should it be, behave, and how should it be enforced. And turning these things on on the project will help you to help people who are just starting to use Puppet from making silly mistakes and making things that are kind of, uh, kind of, of a beginner's thing. So this will do the manifest validation. And similarly, um, Puppet Syntax is also available in a gem called, as you can see there, Puppet Syntax. And you can include this, and this becomes available as a rake task. You can run it. Uh, the, really, there's only two options that's kind of useful, I think, is uh, one is you can exclude files that it's checking. And the last one is if you're using Future Parser. So Future Parser is the new, uh, I think, the iterator and uh, additional parsing option that's available in Puppet. I don't know. I'm actually kind of curious. How many people are using Future Parser? OK, just a handful. So you guys need to turn on future parser equals true. Otherwise, the default parsing is just simply going to run through it, and it's going to go, and it's, gonna, it's not going to actually process it with a future parser on. So this is basically turn that on and process it. So with that said, um, if you just started using these things, what is your module folder going to look like? You're going to have your standard manifest files. You have your test files. And inside the rake file, you can turn on these options. So in here. Uh, you can add in Puppet Labs actually have a project called Puppet Labs Spec Helper, and this brings in a lot of testing help for both RSpec, for, Vag uh, for, sorry, for RSpec, for linting, for uh, Puppet Syntax. You can bring those all in, and when you bring them in, you can list your module configuration down there. So in this case, uh, for your specific project, you want to throw in your option. Puppet Labs Spec Helper is good at bringing in the dependencies, but it has a really, 
um, neutral, I would say, uh, opinion about how things are configured. So I don't think uh, uh, you can just simply bring in spec helper itself and not tweak it. So in most cases, once you bring it in and have, say, this is my dependency from all my rake tasks, you actually want to adjust your rake task so that when you run rake lint or rake uh, validate that it runs with the option that you care about on your set of modules. So with that said, um, those things that we've seen so far are pretty straightforward. They're the lowest cost thing you can do because it doesn't actually require you to write additional lines of code. It's simply some configuration options. You turn it on, you can add it to your testing suite, and they are automatically enforced. So those are lowest, lowest cost, but they're not the most beneficial because at this point, all it is is a static analysis on your code, and you're not having to actually ran it anywhere uh, in your environment. So this is not a good substitute of, hey, this code is ready for production. It does guard you from some silly mistakes, and it guards you from some problems. So we want to take this up one more level. So there's a project out there called RSpec Puppet. And what RSpec Puppet provides is an actual testing of the manifest via a compilation. So right now, the first two things that we talked about is just a static code verification. Uh, and RSpec, what it will do is take the Puppet manifest and try to generate a catalog. And a catalog is this uh, intermediate format which Puppet master compiles to say what should go on the system. And this comes from several parts of information. First, it needs to know the client's facts. So when an agent runs, it tells the server what kind of system it is, what information it is, what custom facts it has. Once this is submitted, the master generates a catalog, and the client enforces catalog. So this lets you know whether your manifest compiles or not. So this test is great in this aspect. So instead of just saying I did a static code check, I actually know that you can get a catalog out of this. And you can simulate different systems. You can supply this multiple system facts to simulate, hey, what would happen if I'm a Red Hat system? Would I get a valid catalog? What would happen if I'm a Mac OS? Would I get a valid catalog? So you can substitute in information about a system to simulate the the initial system input and then say, hey, here are my class parameters. So if I have a class and I want to pass in some options, is it going to generate me a final artifact that's applicable? So can it compile? So when this finally runs, it'll verify that, yes, you de indeed, you can get a catalog. And once you get a catalog, there's several things you can verify about it. Because the catalog can be introspected, and you can check, one, does it have the resources I want? So if you turn on an option, does it bring in the package that I want for that option? Second, does it have the relationships uh, between resources? So sometimes there's a dependency, and when you ran it on a system, you found out that, hey, I forgot this dependency, and later on, I really need to update my repository before I install a package. Is this relationship exist in the final catalog? Or am I just lucky that I ran this and everything worked as expected? So when you f get a final artifact, it, as a catalog, you can actually inspect it and say, hey, is this expectation met? So the whole point of doing this is beyond just looking at your manifest and say, hey, this is good style. Now, does this thing generate something that my system can apply? So this is the next step of what we can do. So um, if you go back and look at the requirements, unlike a static code check, a static code check, all it needs is your code, your manifest, and it can do the analysis on it. To compile a catalog, it needs to actually have the dependencies. So the first thing that we're going to bring in here is what modules does your module depend on? And I think really rarely today people will write a giant monolithic single module. You're going to bring in a lot of libraries, or like standard lib. If you're using uh, something on, uh, on Ubuntu or Debian, you need apt. So you're going to bring in all your module dependencies. And the fixtures.yaml file is just a simply a file that specifies what external depend dependencies you have, and the list is specified under repositories. And the module that you're testing on is typically specified as a symlink, and the symlink is the name of the current module you're testing. So this, one, this example I took is from Postgres. And Postgres basically says the source directory is going to generate a symlink so that it will link to itself, and then it's going to create a modules directory with the following module, and Postgres is going to self-link to your current existing puppet code. So now you have this entire structure and all your dependencies. Now the system can actually compile the catalog. So you have to specify uh, all these dependencies. So with the dependency specified, um, you also have to pass in parameters. So when you specify a system, uh, we need to know the facts. Most of the time, you can't just say, hey, 
here are a system that I don't know anything about, give me a catalog. Pup is gonna say, if I don't know the OS, the catalog won't run, because there's a lot of things that your manifest will depend on to know what to do with it. So if you look through it, anything that's a fact, you have to supply it. And you supply the fact information by this uh, little, um, inside the RSpec test by saying let facts, with a symbol in front of facts, and then inside a hash uh, right here, you can specify all the facts about the system. So in this really simplified case, I'm only providing one fact called OS family, but when you run the test and it fails and it says, hey, I don't have information about this fact, just supply it, because supply the minimum set. Because in this case, when we're doing this test, you won't have Puppet doing a full run. Puppet is not gonna supply the fact, Puppet is not gonna run on your test system to say what kind of fact it is, but it's gonna depend on you, the test writer, to tell it what system are you simulating. So in this case, we're saying, we're simulating a Red Hat system. So even if I ran this test on my Mac OS computer, it's still gonna try to generate a catalog suitable for a Red Hat system. And that's how it does it without actually running Puppet, but with sufficient information about it. And the next thing you wanna do is give it parameters. So if you're using parameterized class in this case, uh, you specify all your parameters for a given class by saying let's params. You don't have to specify the class name again, but go through and list all the parameters you wanna pass in. And uh, use true false values, use strings, and use array and hashes as you would in Ruby. So in this case, uh, once you to see this thing in uh, full details, a lot of people can sometimes come to me and say, hey, I wanna run an RSpec, but it's a lot of effort, so I'm gonna give you something that I call the MVP RSpec. A lot of people say RSpec is a, a huge barrier to get into. Uh, I need to know a lot about Ruby, I need to know a lot about spec testing. So this is what I call the, hey, MVP product. So what you can, what, what's done here is say, after I require the spec helper from Pubble Labs module, I'm testing the class called NTP, and what I'm actually doing is, instead of writing a specific test, I'm looking in the test directory. So how many of you actually know what the test directory is for? Like, do you have tests in your test directory? Uh oh. <laughs> so this might not help a lot of you because you don't even write an example case for your puppet modules because I only saw one hand come up. But if you have examples in your test directory, what this does is look in the test directory and says, I'm gonna load every one of your examples. And when I, once I load my examples, I'm gonna give it one system fact called Red Hat. And I'm gonna say, for every test file, I will at least try to compile it. It uses uh, RSpec's uh, internal built-in tool called Precondition to load that test file. So if you have a test file that says include NTP, it's gonna load the file include NTP and says does it include NTP compile. So you can actually write a series of test cases in your test directory and make it more meaningful. One of the things that kind of bugs me is I see test files and they get out of date. A lot of people don't care about updating their test directories because they said, hey, I've shown you in the manifest, I've updated the parameters list, I've updated the information. I'm not actually gonna bother updating tests. Test is the last thing that, that actually people bother with. At least here I'm gonna say, hey, give me some valid examples in tests. Give me the things that actually make sense in tests. I don't actually want to validate anything beyond it compiles, but at least give me some valid examples. So give me some maintenance in there. So this is kind of like forcing people to, this is like dummies version of RSpec. So if someone wrote, say, hey, I added this, can you add an example? Does it compile? Okay, at least it compiled. So if it, after it compiles and you say, hey, I actually want to do some real tests, here's another example where we can actually do some testing, and this is really, really trivialized, where we are testing NTP, and instead of loading the test directory for a test file, I'm simply saying, hey, NTP, pass in a parameter, and the parameter is called iBurst enables true, and for me to test this, I say it should have a file with this content. So this is some of the meta language inside RSpec, and I'll explain this in a little bit of detail. So we already uh, explained the, the first half of this, which is what are the facts, which is what kind of system are you simulating, and what's the parameter you're passing to the NTP class. And the next thing is uh, the contains is a, inside RSpec, is just a shorthand uh, before any resource type. So when it says contain underscore, you can use any puppet resource that you know about. So if it says contain file, it says inside the catalog, it should have a file with this resource title. And with allows you to specify all the additional properties of that resource. So files, if you're actually managing the owner group mode, you should specify the owner group mode inside RSpec here and say the file should contain, uh, sh the file here should have mode and pass in the mode as a string here. 
And if you have packages, it just should be should underscore packages. If you have defined resource type, it's a double underscore. So if you have something that's um, uh, Apache colon colon site, uh, in here the magic word is contain Apache underscore underscore site. So uh, simply change define resource where there's a colon colon to underscore underscore, and then you can specify that define resource type here as well. So that covers classes, and if you have defined resource types, you can simply pass in here define type, and you can pass in the name of the define type. The define resources are different from puppet resources in the case that it has resource-specific titles. So this additional thing says the simulated resource I have is testDB. So this is the equivalent of saying puppet declaring MySQL testDB with the following two parameters. And the rest of the test is identical where you should validate your condition inside an it block and you specify the resources and the expectations for those resources. So this certainly is a little bit more work compared to writing a standard puppet manifest, because now you have to do additional work on top of it to validate your catalog. But this gives you ability to say, if you have multiple platforms to allow you to do testing statically on a single system without uh, going into the different server types and verifying that, hey, I didn't just write a good puppet manifest, but this puppet manifest is gonna generate a catalog, and when it generates a catalog, it actually meets my expectation and say, hey, the, when I say I'm in, installing a given option, it's gonna enable that option, and I will see that option in my configuration file, or it's gonna see the additional packages, or it's gonna see the additional user accounts. So this allows you to safely upgrade, because if you wanna change the internals of the module, a lot of times, People don't have a handrail to tell them, hey, I changed how a module is written, but am I getting the same catalog out? So this allows you to do refactoring. So when you finish a module, you write a test, and you test all the resources that are in there, you can go back and you can say, hey, I don't really like the structure of how I wrote my puppet manifest. I found a better way of writing it. But if I deploy my new NTP class, is this still passing in the options I want? Did I break backwards compatibility? And also, this always tests new versions of Puppet. Sometimes there's subtle things like undef, not doing the right things. Uh, this will allow you to catch some of the problems where if you're going to a new version of Puppet, you can change the version of Puppet that's running the spec test. And Puppet compilation, if it generates a different catalog, you get a little canary in the coal mine, so to speak, and they'll warn you, say, hey, the next version of Puppet could do something strange because there's some behaviors that's being modified. So this is, if you spend the effort of writing this, this will guarantee that your catalog compiles, it'll have the right resources, and in future when you do upgrades, this is one way of doing testing uh, to give you some assurances that you can move to a new version. If you turn on future parser and you change the behavior of what you're uh, writing in the manifest, that it's actually not changing what's being deployed on the system. So th those are the, some of the additional values that our spec brings in. So at this point, uh, we have some additional files in your directory. Uh, in addition to the rake file that was running our testing, you have a fixtures file in your module directory, and you have a spec directory, and the spec directory have classes to test puppet classes, and a, a defines directory to test puppet defined types. At this point, um, well, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, another file that you need, which is used to check, bring in the dependencies. So for all these tools to work, you need all these additional gems. So there's a file that you can write called a gem file that allows Bundler to install all the dependencies in the directory to do testing. In this case, uh, we need rake because we wrote a rake file. Uh, you certainly need puppet. And the reason that you see a lot of these uh, gem files have an environment variable because this allows you to substitute in what version of Puppet you're doing testing. It's helpful if you look at uh, Travis CI, you can actually pass in multiple versions of Puppet for testing, and this is how it actually uh, allows Travis CI to do those tests, because Travis can pass in environment variables, so you can say, I want to test 3.3, and 3.3 is being gated because that's what I use in production, and I'm going to allow testing on 4.0, since 4.0 is coming out, I'm going to test Puppet 4.0, so you can test the two different versions, and you can select all the versions you specify. So, add in this file, now you have all the things you need to do the basic testing. The gem file will bring in the dependencies, you do a bundle install, will install all these dependency gems, and the rake task will now let you do the uh, puppet spec. Um, oops, I have an extra slide that I, I think is coming up further. So th this will allow you to run all the tests, which I'll have a slide later on explaining. So uh, the problem I have 
and this is one of the challenges I have with the, uh, the tooling is, a lot of people wrote module skeletons. Module skeletons are intended exactly to bring in this set of files, bring into your modules, and um, it's great when you start writing it, because uh, your module's up to date and it's fresh, but as you start building your collection of modules, this gets stale pretty quickly. And the problem with that is, if there's a new version of Lint that came out and there's a new feature and you gotta go around and chase and fix it all up, I feel like it's a giant pain. I gotta go all around, I gotta go fix every one of this because I don't just have a single fixtures YAML file, I don't just have a single rake file, but every one of my puppet modules have a fixture file, have a rake file, have all these directories, and I don't wanna go and tweak and adjust all these. And if I have a gem file, I don't wanna go around and say, hey, the new version of Puppet Lab Spec Helper broke me. Has this ever happened to anyone who actually happens to use? Okay, yes. So, so it's really annoying, and uh, when, you, when it breaks you and you have this independent module directory, you actually have to go around and you have to update 30, 40, 50 modules. So uh, one of the things that have came out, I was originally gonna gripe this about this a lot, but then I found out that Public Labs actually created a thing called Module Sync just to solve this specific problem, and the whole purpose of this is simply to go look at all these dependency files and make sure that, hey, you decided a lint configuration and you have 30 modules, how do you update all 30 of them? And this is their answer to it, and um, I think it works great because it takes care of the problem for fixtures YAML, it takes care of the problem for a lot of the additional files like gem files, but I, I personally use something different because I didn't actually find out about it, and uh, I'm explaining their option, and uh, I'll tell you what I'm doing. So one of the things that I'm doing right now to simplify this is I wrote a gem specification. I, this is the gem file, and the gem, inside the gem specification, I pin everything down. So instead of trusting the upstream to be my source, how many just arbitrarily use a module and update that module every day? You're a brave man. So most of us, I think, pin our module to a version. And just like we pin our module to a version, we should pin our uh, testing suite also to a given version. So in this case, I feel like if you have a dependency on the upstream, rather than let that break you, because I, I see most people's module file, they don't actually pin these versions. And I think it's much better that you pin this to a specific version so when uh, things get updated, here's a gem specification. And in the gem specification, I say what versions I require. And the nice thing about this is, here's my gem file and here's my rake file. I don't actually use Puppet Labs rake task, very sorry. I write my little wrapper around Puppet Labs rake file, and I don't use Puppet Labs module helper. This is really a shim. It doesn't do a lot, but the shim, what it does is bring in the dependency that I know I can trust for testing, and brings in all the additional configuration I have here. So if I go all the way back to this, I turn in all my custom configuration, because these are things I trust, and now, if something breaks, where do I have to update? I only have one place I need to update. I have to update my gem file, and if I have a configuration I need to add, I add it to my custom rake task, and that brings it in. So I don't think this will work for the publicly contributed modules, but I think for your internal module, it solved the headache for me, which is I don't have to go chase 30 modules and decide, hey, there's 30 of them, I gotta go fix them. But again, I don't think I can fix all the problems because that's strictly to Ruby-related stuff, and as you can see, in the directories, there's things like fixtures, and there's things, if you use Travis, there's Travis.yaml, and I'm really annoyed that, unfortunately, they didn't standardize on, if everyone could just load Ruby, my life would be easy, because I can load my custom Ruby, but unfortunately, a lot of configuration are strictly just data, it's just YAML, and you can't do much. So, I think there's a lot of value in terms of doing module sync for those additional files, but if you don't uh, have those kind of issues, you can simplify your life and pin it down. Pin, pin these things down to a specific version and write your own. Uh, I don't see a, a th this module is available uh, on our GitHub site, but um, I would say yours will definitely look different. Don't use ours. We will break you just because we move at our own pace on our own modules, but I feel like everyone should be able to do this for your own internal, and this will give you some sanity when you have to deal with a whole lot of modules, because R10K gave you the sanity for deploying modules, and I think something like this will give you a little bit of sanity in terms of doing testing for your modules, so that when something needs update, you have one location, and this one location updates everything for you. So here's the rake task that I promised I was gonna show earlier. So with those specifications, with that gem file, if you do a bundle install, you can run rake from that directory, and it's gonna bring in 
the whole list of additional features. And there's a, there's a bunch that I haven't covered, but I think the most important ones for testing have been discussed, which are the syntax testing, uh, linting. And the last thing I'm gonna get into here is Beaker. So quick refresher, Puppet Lint, Style Enforcer, Puppet Syntax, Code Parsing, RSpec Puppet, compile the catalog and verify a catalog, and then do some customization, pin your versions, pin your dependencies. So all that was a lot of work to verify your system and iterate that, make sure that everything works. Uh, so at this point, nothing has actually ran on a system. So we're gonna say, at this point, instead of running this in production, what are our options and what we can do to automate testing? Um, a lot of you probably have heard of Packer and Vagrant. I'll just go through this real quick. Packer is basically a VM builder, and really what it boils down to is say no to something that's a mystery box. So uh, I say, like, you, we are here to a higher standard. So whatever your operation team uses, uh, whatever your development team uses, make sure you have the same starting VM, because that will ensure that when you do deploy this in production that you don't have anything different from it. This can do deployment to VirtualBox, Fusion, DigitalOcean. Uh, it's simply a YAML configuration that specifies what to boot, how big the VMs are, where the ISO comes from, and a list of scripts that runs that basically sets up the configuration, uh, sets up Puppet, and does everything. Um, there's a lot of example boxes already out there, so hopefully you don't have to go look and from a clean starting point. You can, Puppet Labs have an example. Uh, Box Cutter is a great repo. Use this as a starting point. And the places that you do need to modify and tweak for your own customization is the Kickstart files themselves. You can add the package you want, or you can simply add a script to install the additional things that you have on your system. And that's, I think it's much easier to start with someone, something someone else has instead of from what, uh, doing it completely from scratch. So once you have Packer and you have a given VM, this creates a box and in a box format that you can launch within Vagrant. And Vagrant uh, will take this pristine box and you can uh, run your puppet manifest on top of it. Uh, there's several things uh, that are useful, which are the specification of puppet as a provisioner inside Vagrant. And what that means is Vagrant, after cloning of the VM, will run puppet and will run puppet with a specific set of options. It will run uh, the most useful one, I think, are the module paths, the manifest files, and some options. One of the things that I think people complain about Vagrant is it's not very uh, dynamic. You can't actually like, change things uh, without modifying the Vagrant config file. So one of the things you could do is use environment variables to pass in uh, manifest files. So this allows you to test different manifest files before you power on Vagrant through, through environment variable. I don't think they've actually have a better solution at the moment. Um, if someone does know, feel free to correct me. Okay. Um, so Vagrant in itself is great for uh, testing one-off VMs, but I feel like the specification itself is a bit cumbersome. There are other tools that allow you to specify the VM formats. Instead of in a complete Vagrant file, you can specify it uh, using YAML configuration. And one of the uh, Vagrant plugin is called Config Builder. And what Config Builder allows you to do is specify a whole bunch of systems using YAML files. Uh, in this case, you install Vagrant and install the Vagrant pl uh, Config Builder plugin. And inside the plugins, you can specify, instead of the Vagrant specification, you s it simply loads the configuration that you have in YAML. And this is an example of one. So you don't have to write out all this in Vagrant file. And this is helpful when you have lots of VMs because you can specify a common role and apply it. I have just showed the entire VM specification here because I feel like uh, this is, gives you all the details that uh, it's equivalent. So you, if you have sync folders, you can specify it. And all the puppet provisioning options that I said earlier are also available that you can specify it within this YAML file itself. Um, this has restrictions because it doesn't actually support a lot of um, all the options Vagrant give you. Uh, another fallback that you can have if you need to specify Vagrant box configurations is to define um, 
a simple method, something like this, where you can pass in a list of options and you can specify CPU, memory, module name, box, port, in a much more simplified format. So this, you can use this to specify your Vagrant file. And I feel like this is a little bit easier to digest. And if you have four or five boxes you need to declare, instead of seeing Vagrant file, Vagrant file, Vagrant file with puppet provision over and over again, your puppet provision part is probably very much similar or identical. And you can simply change out this portions of the VM that are different, which are how much memory it has, uh, what port you want to sync, and simplify this. So these are just like a little wrapper to help you, instead of writing Vagrant files over and over and make it in a format, I think it's much easier to digest. And this is also something that you can put in your custom gem file. So at this point, uh, with this available, you can run Vagrant up, provision, destroy, but this actually doesn't actually perform automated testing. Uh, this is simply, you have a VM, it'll provision, it'll run, and it'll apply Puppet on the system, you'll see the results, but this is all manual. You can, this is great for manual testing. Uh, and Puppet Labs released a tool called Beaker, and as you can tell, Beaker added, requires a whole bunch more files in your modules for testing. And it broke, it's broken down to two parts. One is node configuration. So if you saw the YAML configuration, the nodes are basically YAML specification of what type of system they are, what boxes they are, uh, and what additional tests you can run. So instead of running, um, instead of having you to run this against production, you can specify a variety of VMs, uh, a variety of systems, and what testing you can run against it. So here's an example where you specify a Syntox uh, master, and this very much look at Vagrant config file. Um, and in here, uh, you pass in the puppet manifest that you want to test on the system and give it a list of expectation. Uh, a couple of interesting ones are uh, when, you when you apply the manifest, it should not have any errors. Uh, you can apply the manifest twice, and when you run it a second time, it should not change the system. This makes sure your manifests are idempotent. Uh, and then once you pass in additional parameters, you can test whether the service are running. So you can actually verify, instead of just saying, hey, I installed something, is everything deployed, and is it correct? So with that said, there's Packer, Vagrant, and Beaker, and that's a quick introduction to testing that you can do on the system. Uh, and at this point, does anyone have any questions? Uh, in, instead of the in the individual module route, um, I usually just have a puppet site module. So I don't know if you do site roles profiles. So if you have a site module, the site module will bring in all your dependencies, and the site module will have a de declaration of all the system types you have. So that I think that's a really suitable place to write your spec tests. So uh, the, I think uh, I was running out of time, uh, and uh, the problem here is. Um, uh, I was hoping to talk a little bit more about like where it's most valuable to do testing. I don't think testing, you, you don't necessarily want to do testing at every level. I think the most value you get is probably where the site module is, because that's one place you bring everything in. So if you want to focus energy and write RSpec for one specific place, write it for your site module. Go ahead. Um, I think the coverage code is for Ruby code in there. I don't think there's a coverage for Puppet or a Puppet manifest itself. Go ahead. Um, someone says yes. Uh, unfortunately, that's not my workflow, so I don't know. You had a question? Um, <laughs> I've mostly dealt with customers with, uh, I think, OEL and uh, uh, CentOS. So I don't actually know the Red Hat. I'm assuming there's registration issues for Red, Red Hat, which is why you're asking. I'm sorry. Well, um, thank you again for coming. Uh, I have a few extra copies of the um, Puppet Book. If anyone still need a copy, feel free to come up and grab a, a copy. And love to talk to you guys outside if you have any questions about it.